So welcome to session eight of our journey through Paul's letter to the Romans, that magisterial kind of most ordered, most fulsome statement of his gospel in, in the New Testament. And we have gotten the luxury of going through. Now we will have gone through the whole thing by the end of tonight, slowly, surely, and still it feels fast, right? This is 16 chapters that we did in eight weeks, which is not exactly uh, is, is not exactly a whole lot at a time, but it feels so dense. I'm sure you feel what I feel, which is we understand why Luther taught it for three semesters and still didn't feel like he had enough time. Um, we, we have packed it in and we're ready to bring it down the stretch. And I'm so glad you're here tonight. And I want to begin with a sort of picture of the experience that we have tonight. Uh, I'm a big detective fiction fan, and it gets even better when it's British detective fiction, and gets even better when it's historical British detective fiction. So I'm a Holmes guy. My whole family are Sherlock Holmes people. And the the time, of course, with Agatha Christie or, or Sherlock Holmes or any of the great uh, mystery-solving detectives is when they when they move through all the all the little clues and at the end sometimes for agatha christie in a closed door session right like in a clue game um they they lay out what has happened for the whole experience now some of you aren't detective fiction people but you may be jigsaw puzzle people and we have been through 16 very dense chapters of paul's letter and sometimes it can, confuse, can get confusing how that train of thought is going for the apostles. Sometimes it feels like we're putting together jigsaw pieces. At the end of his letter, I believe, as I said in the email I sent you yesterday, I believe Paul finally puts it all together and that this, this sequence of chapter 14, 15, and 16 don't just finish the letter. They make the letter work. And so there's a whole lot riding on us digging in and, and getting at that solution to the mystery, getting at that finish of the puzzle tonight. So let's pray for some help. And then uh, I, I think we're going to save the uh, save the inside baseball stuff or the house cleaning stuff for a little later so everybody's on by the time we say it. But let's pray and then we'll just dig right in. You pray with me. Our God, we are confident that you will come among us as we read because you keep doing it every time we ask. Somehow you shed light when we gather. You, you shed light when we just stop to look at this brilliant letter. Tonight, we especially want to sense that sort of culminating experience, something you've been doing now for seven weeks. Do again in a way that sends us off from this letter with something to take home, with a new sense of who you are and how you work and who we are and how you work in and through us. It's a lot to ask. We pray for your help in Jesus. Amen. All right. As I say, it is great to see you all and people are, are continuing to gather. Uh, we begin just with an overview of what I think Paul thought he had left to do when he got to the, the end of chapter 13, where we finished last week. Now, let me quickly go through where we've been. Paul opens with this statement of a manifesto about his gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, right? For the power of God for salvation and the righteousness of God are revealed in that gospel. So that was his opening salvo. And we know a lot more now. We know what he's doing when he says Jews and Greeks. We know what he's doing when he says God has to somehow demonstrate the, his righteousness. We, we, we know what's going on here. And after that opening salvo, 
He takes us through the human predicament that needed rescue and then shows in chapter 3, verses 21 through chapter 4, how God effected that, that rescue by Jesus' death and our trust and belief in that. Then in 5, 6, 7, 8, it goes from just something that has happened to us to something that happens in us. We start walking according to the spirit instead of according to the flesh. But of course, through chapter eight, really, the, the, the individualistic Western culture that we, most of us are part of, and that all of us know at some level, could have stayed in play. We could have read all of those first eight chapters in individualistic terms and says, okay, I know now how God saves me and then changes my life, right? But by the time we get to chapter 12, we immediately find that all of this has happened, not so that we're individually better people, but to drop us in a vital, vibrant outpost of God on earth called the Christian community. And so chapter 12, we're transformed into a community of which we're a part of the body. And then we learn how to quell anger. And then in, in 13, how does this body fit within the wider world of Roman government. And then in 14, we now finally encounter a specific way that all that Paul has said coming up to this lands, and it has to do with faith and food. Because by the time we get to, get to the end of the 13th, we know we're a part of community and we have a little counsel on how to, how to be uh, less angry, but we haven't yet had any sort of practical issues of community thrown at us. In chapter 14, Paul moves us out of, oh, I get this stuff, into what would it look like on the ground in the midst of our conflicts and problems. So he throws them a conflict and problem that happening in Rome that we know he had happening in Corinth and others of his Gentile communities, and it had to do with what people eat. So the first thing out in chapter 14 through 15, 6 is a lengthy discussion by Paul of what they should do when Jews are eating kosher and Jewish Christians are eating kosher, some of them, and others are not. When Gentile Christians, some of them are eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols, but others are not. How do we, how do we manage the different perspectives on how food should go. That's Paul 14, one to 15, six. And meat sacrifice to idols sounds so remote from, rel from relevance that we start to nod off if we don't stick with it, but it's not a boring issue. And we'll find that it sets up a whole lot of our tensions and our issues, puts in focus how we might proceed. Then 15, seven to 13, he has to wrap his gospel, kind of bring it all the way back. He then moves to mission notes. Some of you are on missionaries mailing lists. And so once a month or however often you get what's going on. My friend Joe Hoover and his, and his wife Carol for years sent me mission notes from Guinea, West Africa. And you get what has happened, what they're facing, what they hope will happen next. Paul does that in, a, in 1514 to 33. And then final evidence of the gospel in this laundry list of people who are in a Roman living room listening together. Finally, a few footnotes and a blessing, and then it's find a stamp and send the thing, right? So Paul has an order of things that he needs to get to in his view for this to take hold. Let's look at faith and food. You and I, you and I know if you've hosted people in this era, you know, the problems that go into trying to serve more than four people at the same table, because there will certainly be some people who can eat everything. Other people have chosen a vegetarian or keto or paleo or other form of, of diet. Others who have to be gluten-free or have allergies. We are in a period in, in, uh, in cultural history when it's hard to sit down at the same table and eat the same food. That's our form of food confusion. For Paul, it had to do with kosher. 
with the Roman community, which we've already found, Paul has Jewish Christianity on his mind. He spent 9 through 11 trying to figure out Jewish Christianity and Jewish non-Christianity and how they are a part of what God is up to in the world. Here we get to a very practical issue of the fact that in Rome, in the churches in Rome, there are Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. The Jewish Christians have, like Paul, abandoned kosher or have not, like others he, he talks to in his letters, have not abandoned kosher. So what are you going to do about that? If you're Paul, are you going to say, if you really grow up and be fully Christian, you'll be like me? I mean, you people who still have scruples, not so much. And that's one option. He could belittle them and say that what they're doing is wrong and that the real project with food is for everybody to get where Paul gets. He doesn't do that. Let's look at what he does. In 14, 1 through 4, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Now notice here, Paul is talking about judging God's servants. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. Now, notice there are, there are two things going on here. First, in that little uh, layout of what Paul's possibilities are, or his options, I told you he could be little and say, you're bad if you do that, turn into this good thing. He hasn't done all of that, but he has said strong people don't have the problem. Weak people, people of weak faith, still consider some food as off limits. Right? So he has he has done both things that I, that I started the, the discussion naming as options. He hasn't said, your job is to become like me. He has said, this step in faith is not quite fully strong, right? And the irony here is that as he has in this letter, pieced through how to fit Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians together, one might think that the Jewish Christians started 200 yards ahead in a in a 400 yard race, right? We they might we might think the Jewish Christians would be the strong because they have Abraham and they have the Mosaic law and they have the tradition and they have the prophets. But here, some of the Jewish Christians who have scruples about food are among what Paul calls the weaker. Right? What do you imagine he's doing? Is he trying to invert an existing Jewish Christian power? position? Is he trying to undermine uh, things that might distinguish? We've been seeing him do that all along. So putting putting the scrupulous people on the side of the weak may be Paul's way of saying, we're all on equal footing, but in this issue, you're a little behind in getting around to full, faithful, gracious life. Right? Have any of you sat at a table with vegetarians and eaten meat and felt the sneer? Right? Or Vice versa, you're a vegetarian and you're a bunch of through in amidst a bunch of carnivores and you and you feel sort of poo pooed, right? We, I think Paul pictures that going on in the, whoops, sorry about that in the tables that he's imagining in Rome, and so he steps in and he says, "Here's all I need you to do: don't judge each other." Whatever else you do, don't judge each other on this issue. And then he's going to go on and help us a little more with that. He's going to say, well, there are also calendar issues. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. So in the Roman community, Paul pictures division around these issues of what? Jewish holidays, uh, pagan holidays and the food they eat. So, what does he do? 
You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account for ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I imagine there are some among us who are thinking, wait a second, Alan, we're, we're now, what, 11 or 12 chapters past that great good news that we don't win our salvation by the things we do, right? That God loves us, period, that we only connect to that love through faith, not through being better at meat or or worse at me, right? That we, that I thought this was about grace, Alan, and here it seems like judgment camp comes back into play. Well, in, in Paul's letters, there is a non, <laughs> I, I, how do you put this? There is a form of judgment that is of Christians, but is not, you go to heaven, you go to hell. There's, there's a, a, a judgment of Christ of Christians that isn't consigning some to eternal fire. This is about uh, what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And he's talking to Christians, right? So there's a judgment of Christian behavior, but it's not salvation versus non-salvation. It's, it's going to get a little clearer in, in 1 Corinthians 3, in the quote at the bottom of the page. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though the, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So, so some of you, uh, I had one of you or two of you write to me saying, "Wait a second, we've got a, a lot of different judgments going on. Could you could you sort this for us?" Here is uh, what we imagine going on. In uh, Revelation, there seems to be judgment going on that weighs Christians' deeds, not in order to consign them, but in order to reward them for good deeds that hold. Here, Paul says, the ones that aren't wood, hay, and stubble, right? That don't burn up in the fire. I haven't got a long time to nurse your questions on that right now. If you have questions about it, put it in the chat and we'll get back to it either at, at 40 minutes in or in the after party, all right? But that's just to give you a place to put this specific kind of judgment, which is confusing to many when Paul gets back to it after having preached grace. Let us therefore, Paul continues, make every effort to do what leads to peace and a mutual, mutual edification. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it's wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. Now, I'm going to take it off. Um, I'm going to take it off screen share right now because I want us to be able to chat for a bit about this. What is Paul doing? Well, at some level, he's solving a an internal problem within the churches, the house churches of Rome. People seem to be judging one another about what they eat, about whether how Jewish they still are if they're Jewish Christian, about how Gentile they are if they're Gentile Christian, or is, are they eating meat sacrificed to idols or not? And Paul says, all I want you to do is not make one another stumble. Don't judge one another. That would make one another stumble. And don't do what you do thinking it doesn't matter to anybody else. Do what you do with a, a, read the room is a good contemporary idiom for this, right? Read the room, figure out who's going to look at what you're doing and be uh, scandalized. Right? 
Now, this has its merits and its problems in the practice of it. Right? If you've had alcoholic friends, you know that at some level there are different there are different stages in addiction that would imply different behaviors for the friends of the person who's in recovery. Same, same goes true with other substances, right? So some of us might go into, I, I didn't eat, drink alcohol until I was 35 on the base on, or 30 on the basis of this text, right? And the first Corinthians eight text, because I thought if my drinking could cause somebody to stumble, I'm not going to drink. Right now, that's one application, an extreme application of this passage. But that that's a possibility for us. The downside of it is that you get somebody who who might be the the sniveling sort who would say, "Oh, I, you're making me stumble. You're making me stumble." Who becomes the center of the universe by seeming offended at many many things. Right? We are in an age of offense. A lot of people are offended at a lot of things. So how do we walk the line between consenting to the, the danger of offense and giving up anything that might cause it on the one hand and forming Christians who aren't prone to be offended on the other hand? That's one of the issues Paul is saying they face. His, his, his lean is toward deference. I'm supposed to think primarily about you, not about myself. So I didn't drink till I was 30. You know why I started drinking and had my first beer? Because I had some friends who I was playing golf with and I was called the Rev to them. I was called Reverend, right? And we'd go out and play golf and they would, you know, they'd talk about the weather and the roads with me, but they wouldn't talk about anything real with me. They'd do that when they were together. But I was going to be that Christian guy who would, you know, sit on the fun of the party or something. And so I decided I, one day I, we're out on the patio and I get a beer and they practically drop their jaws. And after that, they talked to me. Right? I was trying to read both of those rooms and I'm not presenting myself as the hero in these stories. I'm giving you one case study example of what deference implies, right, for how we navigate what Paul has in mind here. What is the issue that you first think of? There's not a lot of meat being sacrificed to idols. And some of us are not near Jewish Christian people who are still tussling with kosher issues. One good thing to think about for yourself right now is where does this kind of deference apply for me? And so I want to go to the next slide and ground it a little bit. If Paul is concerned about making stumbling, uh, not causing stumbling, uh, he refers to strong and weak people. And this is the beginning of 15. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Right? So Christ chose to defer to human need over what the safety that he craved for a moment in the garden of gethsemane when he said uh father if it's possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not what i want but what you want he ended up making the deferential choice and and the place where this gets grounded is in five and six of this uh, uh romans 15 May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's its home here. Some of you may know better, because not many people read Romans 14 and 15. Some of you may know better Paul's appeal to the Philippians in chapter 2 where he, it's the one where he starts out in verse 1, if, if there be therefore any Con any uh, consolation, any comfort in his love, any fellowship of spirit, all those things make my joy complete by being of one mind. And then he moves to, in, in verse four, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same, and look at this mindset. It's why I have this particular brain on the screen, right? Mindset, have the mindset, uh, the same one as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, didn't regard equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. It goes on to say, but emptied himself, taking the form of servant that is coming in human form. And then he emptied, so humbled himself again, even to death on the cross, right? This, this is a famous passage that was probably an early Christian hymn, but it grounds this same language as Paul uses in Romans 15. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, or in 16, so that with one mind and one voice, or excuse me, get, uh, verse 5, ha may you have the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So uh, those of you who are in Christian formation or education or any part of church that is uh, as related to it have to beam in here, right? Even those of us who are simply being formed in Christ, the goal here is to have the mind of Christ. For God to re gradually make in us the mind that Christ had toward humanity. And that, for Paul, is an utterly deferential mind. We put the other before ourselves. That's a tough sell in, uh, in, in American culture, to be sure, in just human culture. It's a tough sell to say, uh, well, I know preference by L'Oreal L'Oreal is expensive, but I'm worth it, right? Or um, I, I know every commercial is destined to find the way that it can help me. I am in this for me. Paul says, no, no, no. In the community of Christ, you're in it for one another. One rescue of that, by the way, all of us know marriages and all of us know friendships in which one person runs it because the other person always defers. The rescue for the dangers of deferential living is that Paul doesn't picture them as one-sided, as unilateral. Paul pictures a community doing this in which I can be sure that I'm okay with Gwendolyn if I defer to her because I know she's being called to defer right back to me. And when we get a wider community, we've got a bunch of people who are deferring. Uh, one of my wedding sermons that I preach has the first fight of the young couple being, uh, I, I know I've, I've got this job in town, I, but I, honey, I know you want to go and get a grad degree in another city. And, and so we need to move to that other city. And the other says, no, no, I, I want you to have your job. I can put off my grad work. And they have a fight over who's going to defer to whom, right? That's a Pauline fight. This all sets up a way of being with one another in which we defer to the other's needs. And so we don't cause people to stumble because they are in front of us in our values hierarchy. That makes sense? All right, onward. After this, Paul revisits his gospel that we've been going at from the beginning in, in Romans 1, 16 through 17, which for him is not just Jesus saves me, that's certainly a part of the good news. It's funny. In the last week, I've had two ministers sort of ad lib in different parts of worship and say, and so this is the gospel. And not, you know, do a part of it, but then later come to me and said, was that heresy? I said, this is the gospel and it has to do with the community. For Paul, there are many elephant elements to the good news. For him, a big part of the good news is the fact that the division between Jews and Gentiles broken down and now everybody gets in. It's not just, I am saved. It's that, the, it's that God has expanded chosenness to all people. So he revisits that now because he's got to, having taken on this question of Jewish Christianity and Judaism all the way through, he needs to get back and restate his good news at the end in light of what they've seen and what we've seen on the way. And so let's uh, let's read this. I need to move you because you're covering my top line. There you go. Um, 
accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again, it says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will rise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. And then he closes the deal. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you see what Paul has done here? He's revisited his radical statement that Abraham's people are people of faith. Remember that from chapter four. He's basically restating that by saying the, the land is level, just as we've been saying all along. And if you need help, Discerning that, I've got a whole chain of passages in which the prophets and, and the law and the Psalms, all three, foresaw a time when the, when the land was level. All of them. Notice he quotes from 2 Samuel, which is in the histories, from Psalm, which is in the Psalms and Wisdom literature. He quotes from Isaiah, which is prophetic literature, and he quotes from Deuteronomy, which is Torah. I don't think that's accidental. I think Paul is choosing one from each because he wants to show this has been God's will for the whole time. It's a mystery why it's just now being revealed, but this has been the plan forever. Remember that when God called Abraham, God said, uh, I will make you a blessing to all the nations. Right? It's been this intense since Tower of Babel broke out in Genesis 11. How am I going to bless all those different people groups? Now Paul brings it home with Christ has broken down the wall. Christ has made the land level. So there's his restatement of the gospel that's been resounding throughout. And I want to take a moment just to realize the magnitude of that uh, before we get to mission notes. I want to take a moment just to apply that in our, in our context. We'll get back to this a bit in chapter 16, but I want to presage it here. Because it, the, the problem I spend my day job, job working on is American political polarization. But we got so many walls in this culture. And by the way, the world is divided here, there, and everywhere. We've got so many walls that as we read the letter to the Romans, it doesn't take long to get to a thought bubble that, that translates from Jews and Gentiles in early Christianity over to what are the walls in my congregation? What are the walls in my neighborhood? What are the walls in my town, in my region? We don't have to think long to figure out what's dividing Americans, right? So it's a good imaginative process as we finish Romans to put our finger on where is God trying to break down walls among us and how can I be, I be a part of that? If the land is level beneath the cross, how can be, I be a part of breaking down those dividers that are keeping us from community, both in church and out of church? We'll get back to that a little as we look, read 16, but for now, let's get on to Paul's, whoops, Paul's mission notes. In 1515 15 to 16, and I'll let you look in your Bible at this. I'm not going to read everything out. In 1515 15 to 16, Paul reminds them that he's called to preach the gospel among the Gentiles, right? We already heard that in one, uh, in the greeting. He now reminds them again, you know, <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still the guy that God called to go and, and take this good news about Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And so he highlights his career, moving the gospel all the way around the Mediterranean and even as far north as present day, uh, he almost reaches present day Serbia, right? In Illyricum, it was called. It's the southern part of the Balkans, but it's north of Macedonia on our map. 
Paul got a long way in away from the Mediterranean there. And then, of course, he coursed east to to Greece and uh, and down to the to the uh, the Mediterranean end of Greece and has been everywhere. And so he's got this illustrious career starting cold calling uh, Gentiles in in cities around the ancient Near East. Right. But he's running out of space. And this one is worth reading <laughs> because in the latter part of, of 15, and I'm going to move you again. In 1522, is it leading up to 23? Yes. Um, he says in 20, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I'd not be building on someone else's foundation. Now, through this, he is trying to remind the Romans, I didn't just, I wasn't dissing you by not coming. My job is to start uh, start companies, not to build them, right? My my job is to, uh, is to plant churches, not to water them. And so I haven't come to you, not because you're not worth my time, but because somebody already planted you and God bless them, right? And so he reminds them of that. But then it, he says an amazing thing in 1523. He's been at this maybe 15 years. right? He says, but now there's no more place for me to work in these regions. And since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so on my way to Spain, where, by the way, nobody has planted yet. Do you see Paul's sense of vocation? I just I have a friend. Uh, named Todd Bolsinger, and got to have breakfast with him the other day. He's a leadership guru, wrote a, wrote a great book called Canoeing the Mountains about the struggle of leadership. And I'll, I'll just spend a second telling you why it's called Canoeing the Mountains. Uh, when, when Lewis and Clark took off on, you know, on Jefferson's commission to go west, their map of the world had it that after the Missouri River, everything was downhill to the Pacific. Now, think in your mind of what stands between the Missouri River and the Pacific. It's not going to be a downhill canoe because there are the highest mountains on the continent. Right. And so, so, so they, he, he calls it canoeing the mountains because that's how leadership is in our time. The things we didn't expect, the obstacles that we didn't see coming, the things that didn't seminary didn't prepare us for, or the discipleship in our church didn't prepare, prepare us for, are coming at us at breakneck speed. How do we do that? How do we adapt? And how do we change in ways that are faithful? Todd's a good guy to look up, but I was having breakfast with him, and uh, and he is the best guy I know at saying no to the right things. I won't have you raise your hands again, but I want, to, I want you to think of the last time you said yes to something that you ought not have said yes to. Right? We get asked to do good things that aren't exactly what we're called to do all the time. Paul, instead of visiting maybe the most important uh, metropolitan area in the world of his time, the, the, the capital city of the whole empire, instead of visiting there, he chose not to and to keep doing these smaller cities because his calling wasn't to water, it was to plant. I think there's something in that for us as we discern what's our work and what's not our work. Todd Bolsinger has a sharp edge there. I'm much too vague, but you probably have some variety of that issue in your life. Paul was good at knowing what he needed to do, knowing what he was called to do and sticking to it. Finally, after he says, I've run out of space, he says, so I got this little errand to run to Jerusalem. And the errand, by the way, is that he's been collecting money for the poorer churches of Jerusalem and Judea. As he's gone through Turkey and Greece, he's, he's got this great collection now. It's a good thing he's not getting waylaid on the road by a bandit, right? Because he's got all this uh, money and, and stuff to take back to the poorer churches, which, by the way, are mostly Jewish Christian. Do you notice how Paul is here? illustrating what they're going through in Rome. How do we do this with one another? Well, he's had some trouble with Jewish Christians. They've accused him of being too 
uh, abandoning Paul's or Moses's law too quickly. He, Paul has had to skirmish against some Jewish Christians. Nonetheless, he is raising funds among Gentile Christians to take to Jewish Christian communities. He ha- he drops it in here in passing, but somebody in the room is going to say, "Ah, I get it. I get it, Paul." Right? Then he's going to go to Rome because he wants to get to Spain. Not because he wants to lavish in Roman Christianity. He wants to get to Spain, and you got to go through Rome to get to Spain, so he may as well stop by and see them. Again, he's not dissing them. He's defining his vocation. All right, let's bring it down the home stretch. So far, we have had Paul tell us what community is in chapters 12 and 13. And then give us a specific charge within that community, namely how we treat people who eat meat or count days differently than we do. Now we're going to get to the third in his sequence on how salvific or how redemptive community happens. He told us first, we're transformed by the renewing of our minds, and then we're put in a community where we humbly become part of a body and bring our gifts. Then he moved to a little more specific. And when we get there, we put the other in front of ourselves. It's kind of like when we argue over food, right? Let's talk about how it relates to that. Now we get to a third level of that. Because if there are, if there are conflicts in Rome about who is doing better at this thing called Christianity or discipleship, if there's a Jewish Christian conflict, if there are people who are younger and older in faith, if there are uh, some people who think I can eat meat sacrificed to idols and others who don't, some people who think I need to stay kosher, others who don't, Paul subliminally reminds them of something in the course of chapter 16 in a passage that nobody ever preach, preaches. Nobody preaches genealogy or lists, Right. This is a list of greetings, and I said it at the beginning. We did it to acquaint ourselves with the Roman community in week one. Now we come back to it because it has more meaning to us now as we've seen Paul spin out his theology of community, because at the end, he tells them these house churches that are all gathered probably into the same place, squeezed in to hear this at the same time. He says, greet. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, two Jews whom Paul met in Corinth, who have been kicked out of Rome, and that's how Paul meant them, by by Claudius' edict of taking the Jews out of Rome, who became Christians and helped Paul build churches in different places, and who now live in Rome and host a house church in their home. Greet these Jewish Christians who are kind of Pauline in their interpretation of things. Greet greet Eponidas, the the Asian Christian, who was the first Asian Christian in in Paul's experience. Greet Mary, that's a Jewish name. Greet Andronicus and Junia. This, This Junia, by the way, and I don't have any time to go into it, may be the Joanna, the wife of Cusa, in in Luke chapter eight, one of the people who funded Jesus's mission because of how spelling went across the uh, across Greek and and Latin, Andronicus and Junia, who are probably both Jews, and whom Paul says were apostles before I was, that also puts us back in Galilee possibility. Ampliatus, Urbanus, Dacus, Apelles, Aristobulus's household, Herodian. Uh, who seems to be somebody from the house of Herod. Herod moved to Rome when he was kind of unseated in Galilee and and, uh, in the east. He moved to Rome and brought his whole entourage with him. And some of his entourage is going to church in in Roman churches, right? Narcissus's household, Trophana, Trophosa, Persis, those are three women, Rufus and his mom, another woman, Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobas, Hermas, Philologos, Julius, Nerus, 
and his sister and Olympus, and then all the people who are in all the places, right? Paul names it either 25 or 26. It depends on if you call, count uh, and Aristobulus, who doesn't seem to have been a Christian, but his household is full of Christians. Um, and, and what's amazing here, folks, is that when scholars dig behind and try to figure out what these names and names in the ancient world told us more about people than our naming system does. You, uh, if you have kids, you probably named them, or if you aren't a parent, you were a kid, and your parents probably named you because they liked it in the baby book, or they named you after somebody in the family or something like that. Ancient names told status much more than ours, told ethnicity much more than ours, all of those things, right? And so in this room, you have the most outlandish collection of men, women, Jews, Gentiles, uh, people of great means, day workers, freed people, slaves. You've got all of the different classes, genders, and uh, and sort of religious backgrounds that you could possibly gather in this room listening to this letter. And this is Paul saying, greet one another. Now we take that greet thing as if, oh, say hi to. No, he, it's, a, it's, a, it's an imperative. It's a second person imperative. Greet one another. What do you think that looks like? Do you, you know the passing of, your, of the peace in your church if you do that passing of the peace? You know how uh, you, you choose some people and you don't get to other people? <laughs> and some of the criteria by which we do or don't go and pass the peace to somebody? Are we in a, in a little bit of a... a Fraca with somebody? Do we do we just feel more comfortable with some people than with others? Paul tells them, greet everybody of all these different stations and ethnicities. Greet everybody. Shake hands. Give one another the holy, uh, the 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 kiss of holiness. Or the uh, right. Paul is matchmaking. This is the Yenta from uh, from Fiddler on the Roof. You know the matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. That scene. This is the Yenta who matches people up there on the right. She looks very Yentish, right and. Paul is playing Yenta with the, with the Christians in Rome. That's one level at which he's continuing his drive toward community. The next is when you do break down the diversity in that room, nowhere else in the Roman Empire is such a strange collection gathered. It's as if Paul is saying, all right, I've done my best for 15 chapters. I've taken you through the intricacies of the good news as I understand it. I've given you at it in the most considered and ordered way that I can imagine. I've given you the robust gospel of Jesus Christ in the way that it makes all people a part of God's hope and God's plan. But if you aren't on board yet, look around you. Look around the room. This isn't happening anywhere else in the Roman Empire. Look around the room. The gospel works. For Paul, the evidence of the gospel is not another person coming forward at the time when decisions are called, although that's a great thing. The evidence of the, of the effectiveness of the gospel of God is when, unlike, can be together in a room Praising God as one, as Romans 17, or as Revelation 17 has it, when all the tribes and all the nations are gathered before the throne, singing praise to God. Paul says this happens nowhere else in the empire, and you're doing it. How do you think you became able to do that? The gospel works. And I want to close our time together, these eight weeks by reminding you that the meeting of which you're a part isn't happening anywhere else either. I teach a lot of Bible studies, friends. I teach a lot of Bible studies with a lot of different groups. And in, in some of them, in most of them, MLK's indictment on the Christian community continues, which is that 11 on a Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. Some of the segregation is by race. Some of it is by ideology, left and right. We find like and we sit with like. I want you to think of the difference in this Zoom room. 
Tonight, there are about 155, 160 of you. We've had up to 200, a little more. You come from all classes, all educational levels, all stations in churches, all races, all uh, ethnicities. We hear accents during the question and answer time. You, you are the most eclectic, most diverse group of Bible studiers together that I've ever seen. And I think you may be the most happening in the world right now. It's just a, an accident of how Kelly and her gang have put together this group. Paul would look at us, just as Paul looked at those ancient Romans, and say, you don't believe the gospel yet? Look around you. It is possible the gospel works. Right. So I close by reminding you of that, reminding you of the fact that we've been learning uh, learning Romans for eight weeks together across great distance and cultural distance and all kinds of difference. Paul's point is the gospel works. It worked among them. It works among us. May God add God's blessing to what we've we've learned together and take it out to the streets through us. Now, when we put it all together, we come to the end in a final blessing that Paul writes in the latter part of, of 15. Now, to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery, hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the, the obedience that comes from faith. To that only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen.